Greetings, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. I, I look forward to sharing with you, and, and before I, I get started, just to, to let you know, the things that I'm going to share with you tonight, um, in, in all honesty, I, I feel very much that I was a spectator in what God was doing. Uh, I won't have time tonight to share all 26 years of, of prison chaplaincy, but the things that I will share with you are things that God did. And I, I'm often reminded of the story of Balaam uh, and his donkey. You know, the donkey spoke the words of God uh, to Balaam. And uh, sometimes I feel, if I'm anything, I'm, I'm like Balaam's donkey. So uh, please understand that. Um, a little background on myself. Uh, I wasn't always a priest, obviously, and, and I started out... Um, while I was in college working for the Forest Service, uh, I became a smoke jumper uh, up in Montana and Alaska and Idaho, uh, parachuting out of airplanes into forest fires to, to put out forest fires. And I, I like to say that uh, maybe a few falls on my head from, from bad parachute handling led me to prison ministry. But, and it's not the truth. God led me to there, and, and I hope you see that when, when, we're, when we're done tonight. So with that, let's begin. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Back in January, well, actually in, in uh, December of 1984, <clears throat> my wife and I were looking at what we were going to do in the future, and an opportunity came up to apply to um, a couple of prisons down in Arizona as a chaplain. And so uh, I put in an application and went and interviewed, and, and we ended up going, uh, for one of the interviews, I went on death row. And there were like a dozen of us candidates for this job, and all of them looked very pastoral. And they were in there speaking pastoral words to these men that were on death row, awaiting execution. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm way out of their league. You know, I, I, and so I ended up just chatting with these guys, and talking with them about their lives, and, and what they did in, in there, and and lo and behold, on, in both prisons, I came out the number one choice. They called me and they said, we want you to be our new chaplain. And so after much prayer, we went uh, down to Douglas, Arizona, to become uh, the first chaplain of that prison. And when I was uh, filling out the application, believe it or not, my, my wife said, you know, if you're going to apply for the job of chaplain, you better learn how to spell it right. I had misspelled Chaplin when I was applying for the job. I like Charlie Chaplin, you know. So I I knew nothing about prisons. I knew nothing about being a chaplain. And I walked in the first day all excited that they were going to teach me how to be a chaplain. I walked boldly into the warden's office. He stood up, walked around his desk, shook my hand, and said, Welcome, chaplain. Go do what chaplains do. And he turned around and walked away. And I was just there dumbfounded. I was going, oh my gosh. And with that, I turned and walked out, went through all the, the razor wire and everything, and walked out onto the yard for the first time. And as I was walking across the yard, I saw two of the biggest human beings I've ever seen in my life. They were leaned up against the wall, and they had arms bigger than my body. And they were standing there looking at me as I was walking, and I thought, oh my gosh. These guys are in prison because they killed a chaplain. I know it. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I, I am not going over there. And so I turned, and I started to, I said, I'm going to go look at this side of the yard first. And that still, small voice of God spoke to me right then. And I can still hear that voice saying, that's not why I've called you here. And the next thing I knew, I was walking over to these chaplain killers stuck my hand out and said, hi, I'm the new chaplain here. And these guys smiled, the biggest smiles, and they said, chaplain, we are so glad you're here. We are so glad. We need you here. And that was my introduction to being a chaplain in a prison. And I realized my job was to love these men, not to judge them on what they have done, but just to love them and to, to be there to help them in any way I could. Well, time passed. Uh, I went from being a state chaplain to a federal chaplain. We were still in Arizona. I had been with this wonderful warden for four years, serving under him in a federal prison. And the chapel was packed out every day. Things were going great. I thought, this is wonderful. 
One day I'm passing by the warden's office. And he was a, a deacon in a, in a Southern Baptist church. And he talked with this Southern accent, which y'all don't have an accent, I'm sure. But for me, it was an accent. I grew up in Arizona. And, and as I was passing by his office, he saw me and he goes, he always called me son. He goes, son, uh, you're all going to get mad at me with my <laughs> interpretation. But he said, he was from Alabama, so it doesn't count. He said, son, come, <laughs> come, on, come on in here. I want to talk to you. And I went in there and he started telling me about this maximum secure prison that was going to be built in Colorado. And he told me, he said, son, this is, this is going to be the vilest place on the face of the earth. He said, there are going to be men there that are beyond all hope. He said, they'll be throwing feces and urine on staff members. They'll be trying to kill each other. They'll be trying to kill staff. He said, it's an ugly, horrible place. And I'm sitting there nodding, saying, yeah, warden. And then he looks at me and he says, son, I think God's calling you there. And I said, excuse me, Ward? <laughs> and he said, no. He said, now hear me out. He said, we've been together for four years. He said, I've watched you. He said, I think you've got the gifts from God to go and minister in a place like that. And I said, well, with all due respect, sir, I'm going to go pray about it. He said, you don't need to pray, son. Just tell me. I'm going to make it happen. I said, no, no, I'm going to go pray. So I thought, this is crazy. Where did he come up with that? So I went back to my lovely wife, and I said, Ashley, you're not going to believe what the warden said to me today. And I ran it all down to her. She said it afterwards, she said about 30 seconds of fear ran through her. And then all of a sudden, the peace of God came on her. And she said, I think it's the Lord. I thought, what do wives know? I'm calling my spiritual father. So I called my spiritual father. I got him on the line. I told him everything in his immediate words. It's Jesus. He wants you to go be Jesus in that place. And so the next Monday, I walked into the warden's office, and I, I quoted Isaiah. I said, warden, here am I. Send me. And he pounded his desk. He said, that's all I need to hear. So the next thing I knew, a few months later, we were on our way to Colorado. And I got there before any of the, the men showed up in this prison. I had a chance to pray over the place, went around blessed cells, did everything I could think to do uh, to be able to, to be a chaplain in this place. And in 1994, November of 1994, the first busloads began to arrive. One of the very first men I went to see he had just gotten off the bus. I walked up. In this prison, each cell has two doors. There's a big iron door, solid. And you open that one and you walk into what they call a little celly port area. And there's bars there. And so I would always open the outer door and walk in and talk to the, to the men through the bars. One of the first guys I talked to, I walked in and he looked at me and he called me every filthy name even names I hadn't heard of. I'm sure they were filthy, but I didn't even know what they meant. And I thought, wow, this is going to be a difficult ministry, Lord. The next day I went back to see this guy and he apologized. He said, Chaplain, I'm sorry. I was having a bad day. And from there we began a dialogue. And, and with each of these men that came in, I found I just wanted to get to know them, wanted to be there to show that I cared, that I loved them, and I was going to make a difference in that place. One of the things I felt that, that when I was going up there, I, I said to myself, Lord, if you just want me to plow rocks for the next few years, I'll plow rocks. If that's all that there is to do, I'll plow rocks. But I pray that you will bring men to your holy faith. Well, after we'd been there a while, a man rolled in, the first thing I got from him when he arrived was he had watched, we had closed circuit television there. And on the closed circuit TV, I could put out videos. And so I would videotape uh, divine liturgies. Uh, wherever I would go, I would videotape. I would do studies. And we'd put those on the TV. Videotape uh, divine liturgies. Uh, wherever I would go, I would videotape. I would do studies. And we'd put those on the TV, as well as, you know, for all the different faiths, I had to put on videotapes for them as well. And 
this man wrote me and said, I'm suing you because you don't have any white supremacist videos on your television. And so I thought, oh boy, here we go. So I went down to meet this guy. And we had heard before this man came that this man was an absolute animal. That in the course of, of him being at another prison, he got so angry one day that he ripped the sink off his wall. And he pounded a, a hole through a concrete wall into the next cell. And so they rolled him up and brought him to our prison. And so I went up to his cell, I opened the first door, I walked in, and I stuck my hand through the bars. And I said, I just wanted to introduce myself to you. And he came over and he took my hand. And I just held his hand for a while and we talked. He told me later that it was the first time in five years that anyone had touched him except for putting on restraints, handcuffs, belly chains, black box, leg chains. First time in five years, and it impacted his life. He began to think about reading some books about my faith. And so I sent him, the first book I sent him was the book on the life of St. Anthony by St. Athanasius. And he read that, and to make the long story shorter here, uh, I had the privilege of baptizing him in the faith as Anthony. Soon after he was brought into the Orthodox faith, amazingly, one day he said, he said, Father, I think that I would like to try iconography. He said, would it be okay with you if I tried something? And at this time, all they would allow this man to have was a little stubby pencil and a piece of white paper because they said he could make a weapon, a bomb, out of anything. And so that's all they would allow him to have. And so I said, go ahead. And so he, he drew an icon. And I looked at it and I said, wow, that's incredible. I said, do some more. And he started doing these pencil icons that were incredible. Um, Later, he gained favor with the administration. In fact, the head of security of the prison came to me one day, and they said, what did you do with this man? He has gone from being an animal to an absolute angel. And I said, I didn't do anything. The Lord did. And he said, he laughed. He goes, yeah, right. He goes, Whatever you did to him, go do it to the rest of these guys in here. <laughs> but he, they gave him favor, and they, they allowed him to have more than just the stubby pencil. They allowed him to have some chalk. He took the chalk and he ground it up, added toothpaste, a drop of garlic oil, and made his own paints and plucked the hairs out of his head to make brushes with. And he began to paint icons. After a while, they gave him more favor and he was able to get paints and he began to paint icons. We'll talk more about that at the end. That was the very first man who, come, who came to the faith. In, in that prison. And it began a work that I don't have time to tell you all the conversion stories, but I want to share some of them with you because they're so incredible. One man was a leader in a notorious gang in prison. Notorious. Uh, in gangs in prison, most of the gangs have a rule that you blood in and you blood out. In other words, in order to join their gang, you have to kill someone. If you ever try to leave their gang, they kill you. It's the way it works. I would go by this man's cell, and for two years, I would pass by this man's cell. And this is what I got. Just like that. Two years, I would come in, I would give him greeting cards, put a newsletter on his bars. I'd say, how you doing today? Not a word. He would just glare at me. Just glare at me. After two years... All of a sudden, one day, out of the blue, he said, Chaplain, do you have anything I can read about your faith? I went, wow, you do talk. I said, yeah. And so I sent him the way of the pilgrim. And that started him on a journey. He began to consume Orthodox books. And I had the privilege of baptizing him into the faith. And after he had become Orthodox, I talked to him one day and I said, you know, help me to understand I said, two years, you glared at me. You wouldn't say a word to me. And he goes, oh, Father, I was just checking you out. 
I said, for two years? He goes, Father, you have to understand something. In here, time means nothing. He goes, there are going to be guys checking you out in here for 10 years because they want to see if what you're talking is what you're walking, if it's what you really live. And he said, I would listen carefully when you walk down the range, and I would hear guys yelling and screaming at you and cussing at you. And he said, I would listen and I would hear your response. And after two years, he said, I wanted what you had because there was peace there that I had never known in my life. We talked about him becoming an Orthodox Christian because it meant he had to leave this gang, and he was high up in the gang. And he said, oh, there's a contract on my life. Any place I go from here, he said, there'll be people trying to kill me. And I said, well, does, does that bother you? Does that, you know, are you worried about that? And he laughed. He said, Father, he goes, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in prison. If they kill me, I immediately go to the kingdom of heaven. He goes, it's a great thing. I'm not afraid of dying. He said, I just want to live my life to please God now. Now, one of the, the unique things about this ministry is, for the first time ever, I actually had one of our bishops take an interest. Metropolitan Isaiah of Denver. I talked to him about what was going on, and he said, I want to come down. I want to meet these guys. And he's the only bishop that has ever been into a prison where I, I have served. And this man is amazing. He would come twice a year, and we would go around and meet all the guys that had become Orthodox. We'd meet all the catechumens, and we would go through the, the entire prison. He was exhausted when he left, but he made such a difference in these men's lives. One man we called the surfer. This guy, when he first came to our place, he was, he was wild and crazy. He figured out how to bust the windows. Each cell had a little narrow window where you could see out. And he figured out, and he, he even showed me one day. He goes, watch this. And he, he would back up to the window, and he would hit that window so hard it would shatter the window. And they would throw him in the hole for a while, and then they'd bring him back out, and he'd break another window. And he was out of control. I was like, how do I get through to this man? Because his education was very, very low. And I thought, you know, over in the Protestant section, I've got these little westerns that are very simple reading, about third grade level, westerns. And so I, I asked him one day, I said, do you like westerns? He goes, oh, I love westerns. So I gave him, and he liked them, and he started reading them. But he couldn't handle the orthodox books, and so we would talk about the orthodox faith. Well, he became a catechumen, and, and Metropolitan Isaiah was coming to visit the prison. And so I explained to him how you greet a bishop. And we went through it. I had him practice and practice how to do this. Well, he is out on the rec yard when, and he was by himself on, on the rec yard and he was hitting a, a handball against a concrete wall. And so I called him off the rec yard to meet the Metropolitan. And he's coming in and I'm honestly praying, okay, come on now, you've got to remember what to do. And he walks in. I don't know if you've ever met Metropolitan Isaiah. He's an ex-Marine, rides a motorcycle. And the man walks in off the rec yard, comes up to the bars, and he goes, Dude, what's happening? Whoa! And he comes up, and the Metropolitan reaches his hand through the bars. And this guy goes, ah, You don't want to shake my hands. They're all bloody. I've been out there playing handball by myself, and I, I hit my hands on the, on the wall. And he's trying to explain, and the Metropolitan reaches out and takes his hands. And he pulls him in close. And he holds his hands. And for the next five minutes, he just talks to him, holding his hands. The next day, I went to see this guy, and he said, I am, I am Orthodox. He said, that man, he said, he didn't know if I had AIDS or diseases of all kinds, and he held my hands like that. He said, that man had no fear in him whatsoever. And I had the joy of baptizing him. He was still wild and crazy. He had a hard time ever calling me father. He called me padre, and uh, he called me all kinds of things. But, you know, but nonetheless, he bore witness to Christ in that place because his life was transformed, and he no longer was trying to break windows or hurt anybody. 
He was living a life of peace. He was in the shower all the time. That's why we called him the surfer, because he was always in the shower. He was from Southern California, and his life was surfing. And so he would get in the shower, and he would pretend he was surfing in there. <laughs> but a wonderful man. Well, <clears throat> Metropolitan Isaiah, one day, we were talking as he was getting ready to leave the prison. And he said, you know, these men, he said, some of them are living incredible lives. He goes, they are praying all the hours. He goes, they're up at midnight, and they're praying. He said, have you ever thought of tauntering these men? And I said, no, your eminence, I've never thought of that. He goes, well, think about it. We should think about this. And so some time went by, and I was uh, going up to Colorado Springs to serve in a church there, and I walked in, and Metropolitan Isaiah was there, and I went over to greet him. And the first thing he says to me is, well, have you thought about it? What do you think about tauntering those guys? And I said, Your Eminence, how would it work? How would it work in a place like that? He goes, I got it all figured out. He goes, I'm going to be the abbot of the monastery, and you're going to be their spiritual father. He said, you decide who gets tauntered. And my next visit down, you set it up, and we'll tauntur them. We ended up tauntering five men in that place as monastics. Five men. And one of the men, when we went to his cell to taunter him, we, we brought a, a rasson with us and we would reach through the bars and put the rasson on him. And then Metropolitan Isaiah would reach his hands through and do the prayers and then taunter the man, cutting his hair. This man, when we put the rasson on him, he wrote me this long, long letter afterwards. And he said, suddenly, he said, the bars melted away. And he said, there were hundreds of men there, all dressed in black, all with beards. And he said, they were all in attendance at my tonsuring. It was incredible. And these men were so serious about their faith. Um, two of the men... Uh, the way the, the, the prison is set up, there's nine different units, and all the different units have different security levels and different purposes. But in this one unit, uh, there's three ranges, and, or six ranges, and, and in each, each one there's two sets of cells, about 12 cells, uh, top and bottom. And the men would do what they call getting on the phone. They'd take a roll of toilet paper, and they would put it over their shower, and they would blow all the water out of the pipes took a while to get the phone system up. But then they could talk on the phone to each other. We happened to have two of the monks, one living above the other. And they were on the phone one day, and they were talking about Great Lent coming up. It's almost Great Lent, and they were excited. They were going, oh, I can hardly wait. Oh, I love the fasting. They developed a plan. They were going to read through the New Testament once a week through all of Great Lent. Every week they were going to do the whole New Testament. And they had all this stuff going on. Well, as you might suspect, with 24 cells in there, it wasn't a private line. It's a party line. And other guys like to listen in when guys are talking because you never know what you might hear. Well, the guy on the range is listening in. And he begins to get excited. He doesn't know anything about orthodoxy. But he's getting all excited and he's going, wow, I'm going to fast to himself. Well, he doesn't know how orthodox fast. Fast. So, the very first day of the fast, he quits eating everything. <laughs> and after three days of not eating anything, he told me this story later. In the middle of the night, he is there. He wakes up in his bed. And he said, there was a woman, bright, white, glowing, this bright light, and had a baby in her arm. And she looked right at him and she said, take my baby, take my baby. And he said he got so scared, he threw the covers back over his head and, and when he peeked out, she was gone. The next night, the same thing happened. Bright, glowing, white. And she said, take my baby, take my baby. And the third night, it happened again. The next day, I was making my rounds. I came by to see the monks. They go, you got to go see so-and-so. He's tripping. Something's happened to that man. 
Trippin is, is a monastic word found only in prison. <laughs> they go. I, I go up there and he tells me this story of what he had seen. And then he looks at me and he goes, Father, what does it mean? And I said, well, I said, I'm not an interpreter of visions or dreams. But I said, it sounds to me like the mother of God has been appearing to you, telling you to commit your life to her son, Jesus Christ. And he said, you know, I was thinking it was something like that. (laughs) And I said, but I said, tomorrow, amazingly, tomorrow, I have someone much wiser than me coming. That was Metropolitan Isaiah. I said, I'm going to bring him by because he's one that may be able to give you an even deeper explanation. So the next day, Metropolitan Isaiah came on his visit. And and, uh, I briefed him on what had happened, and so we went to see this young man. Metropolitan Isaiah said, well, tell me what happened. And he went through the whole story with him. And when he finished the story, Metropolitan Isaiah didn't explain anything to him. Instead, he turned to me and... If you've been around Metropolitan Isaiah, when he looks stern, he turns around and he goes, baptize him. I said, your eminence, he's not even a catechumen. He doesn't know. He He goes, God has spoken. You baptize him, then you catechize him. I said, yes, your eminence. We made arrangements, and as quick as we could, we baptized him. And then I catechized him. That's how much God loves these men. You know, these men are people that even, even the warden who thought I should go up there, before I left, he said to me, he said, Chaplain, don't expect any kind of ministry with these men. These men are beyond hope. They, they are men that are removed from society and they will never be a part of society again. Well, some of them are. Amazingly, some of them are. One young man was a Rastafarian had the dreadlocks. I couldn't understand a word this guy ever said. He would talk to me in Rasta, Rasta ease, and I would, I would be at his cell, and I would be going, oh, what did you say? What? And he would get so frustrated, and he would ramble on and on, and I could never understand. But another man moved next to him, and I'll tell you this other man's story, but this man was already orthodox. And he began to talk to this guy about the orthodox faith. Well, this man embraced orthodoxy. And he was the one that got out of prison. Amazingly. When he got out, he asked me before he got out, he said, Father, I'm going to such and such city. you got to find me a church. So I looked up the Greek Orthodox Church. And I said, here's the address, here's the phone number. Uh, you know, let's see what happens. I got a call a few months later from a lady who was in charge of their youth department. And she said, we have this young man. I've got him right here in my office with me. And he said, you know, uh, I'd I'd like to put him on the phone with you so he, he could talk to you for a second. He got on the phone and he said, Father, it's incredible. They trust me. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's nice. They trust you. He goes, no, 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 you don't understand. They trust me. He said, the Philoptos, he said, well, they made me a janitor here. They gave me a job when I got out of prison. And they embraced me. They loved me. I asked if I could serve in the altar, and and the priest has me serving in the altar. And after a bit, they they asked me if I'd like to to speak to their youth, and I've spoken with their youth. But he said, the Philoptos were meeting just this last week down in the basement, not basement, but in the church hall below, you know, downstairs. And he said, the Philoptos were all meeting there. And he said, it was time for them to go upstairs and pray. And he said, you know, I was bussing tables and I was serving food and all that. And he said, all those ladies left. And he said, you know what's amazing? Every one of them left their purse on the table. He said, Father, they trust me. They trust me. Now listen to the rest of the story. This man, whom I could hardly understand when I first met him, went on to get his bachelor's degree. And guess what? Criminal justice. (laughs) He graduated with his bachelor's degree. He went on to get his master's degree. And this past May, he graduated with a master's in criminal justice 
and was hired by the probation department in this city. Judges attended his graduation. Now, can you imagine being a young criminal, some punk kid who thinks he knows it all, and your parole officer happens to be somebody from the most maximum secure prison in the world? There's nothing going to get over on this guy. But again, God is so wonderful and good that he sees into the hearts of these men. Even though society has rejected them and said they're incorrigible, nothing will ever happen. God sees their hearts. This other man that that helped bring this guy to orthodoxy, he was studying to be, of all things, a Buddhist priest. And as a chaplain, I have to help each person with whatever faith they are. And they come up with some wacky ones. But this man was going to be a Buddhist priest. And so my job was to make sure that he got uh, his correspondence courses in from Japan, where he was studying with a sensei over in Japan. But you know, as I helped him, we developed a relationship. And he began to watch the videos on TV about orthodoxy, and one of them in particular was on Mount Athos. And it was the one the thousand uh, years is this one day, I think that's the name of it. Anyway, it's about Mount Athos. And one day he says to me, he says, you know, Father, I think the Buddhists and the Orthodox have a lot in common. And I said, yeah, in what way? <laughs> And he said, well, he goes, you know, you guys use incense. We use incense. He goes, you got bells. We got bells. I said, yeah, there's a lot of similarities there. And he goes, you believe in this sense of interior prayer? And he said, so do we. And so I said, well, would you like to read some books about that interior prayer? And so I sent him books on the Jesus prayer. And he began to read these books. And he began to read other books on the early fathers. And one day, as I was visiting with him at his cell, he said, Father, he said, you know, if somebody like me decided that I should become Orthodox, would the Orthodox Church have me? And I said, in a heartbeat. And so I had the privilege of baptizing this man after a time. He also got out of prison. And he's been out for several years now. And I'm happy to report to you. This man was one that we didn't select to be a monk because he was going to get out of prison. And part of my criteria for them being tonsured was that they were going to spend their life in prison. I didn't think it was right for somebody to be tonsured a monastic and then get out of prison and face all the temptations of the world and not know where they're going. And so this man was getting out, and so he wasn't tonsured, but he always told me, he said, I want to be a monk. I want to be a monastic. That's the call of God in my life. Well, he'd been out for several years, got off his probation, and this last September, he was tonsured a monastic over in California. Incredible. These are men that society had given up on, men that said, no, nah, they're, they're no good. These guys aren't worth the time. And, you know, we stop and we think about this and we think, Lord, what, what has happened that, that we can so easily dismiss people that are made in the image and likeness of God. We can so easily say to them, no, no. You know, you no longer are a human being. No. No matter how tarnished and how muddy that image of God may have become, there's still hope for each and every person that finds themselves in prison. One man... Uh, a very Greek last name, came to our prison, and he was listed as Muslim. And I thought, yeah, right, this guy, Muslim. I I didn't believe it, but I would send him all the Muslim materials. And he'd been there about a year, and finally, one day, he stopped me, and he said, Father, he said, you know, I'm not Muslim. I said, I didn't think you were. But you're listed as Muslim, so I sent you this stuff. He goes, Father, I'm Orthodox. I said, hmm. He said, uh, and he told me a story. He was part of an Orthodox church. had been an altar boy. Altar boy. Served in the altar every Sunday. When he was about 14 years old, he took off, running wild. And his life led him on a life of crime that eventually put him in this maximum secure prison. 
And with tears, he said, how do I come back? I want to come back to my faith. We brought him back into the faith through confession. And we brought him into the faith once again. And the man's life was transformed. He's out, and he's doing quite well. But he influenced other people. Because this man was known as being a man of action. He was in a prison, another prison, the reason he ended up at our prison. They were having some altercations, and he came out of his cell with two homemade shanks taped to each wrist and was fighting. And his partner in the fight was a man who lived with him at this same prison, and they would walk together during wreck time. This man was one of the meanest guys. I remember him telling me one time, he was trying to ingratiate himself to me. He said, Father, he said, I want you to know that I've never killed anybody that didn't need killing. <laughs> I said, that's mighty good of you. <laughs> this man wanted to know what had happened to his buddy. He goes, oh, what, what's going on? How did he change? He said, he used to have all this anger in him, and now he's this man of peace. And he said, it's for real. He said, I've tested him. I can't get him mad anymore. He said, what has happened? And this man began to share the Orthodox faith with him. And I had the privilege of bringing this man also into the faith. Oh, there's a lot of stories I could share, but I want to share a little bit here from... Uh, oh, I got one more story I saw here that I've got to tell you. This was incredible uh, that I almost forgot. My wife and I and my whole family went to Ionian Village. And I was serving as the priest there in Ionian Village. And uh, part of going to Ionian Village is you go around to these different monasteries and different places. And we went to the monastery of Osios Lucas, Blessed Luke. And we're at this monastery. And, you know, we've got hundreds of kids with us from Ionian Village, and it's noisy, and we're going to do Vespers uh, in, in the main church there at Osios Lucas. But there was some time, and so I thought, I'm going to slip away by myself for just a few minutes and pray. And I went into their small chapel, and I prostrated myself before the royal doors, and I just began to pray before the royal doors. And I looked up, and there was a face of an inmate all the way back in Colorado. I'm in Greece. And his face was just as clear as looking at you right now. And I said, Lord, why? This was an African-American man that had shown absolutely no interest in orthodoxy whatsoever. I said, Lord, why am I seeing this man? No response. I don't know. Went back. I knew I needed to talk to this man about it. But it took me two weeks. I'd stop by his cell and I just couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to, to say it. And finally, one day, I, I said, i got to talk to you. I said, because I had taken videos while we were over in Greece. And I showed uh, hours and hours of, of videotapes to the men. And I said, you know, have you been watching any of those tapes when I went to Greece? He goes, oh yeah, I've been watching them all. And I explained to him what had happened. And his eyes got big and he said, why me? Why did you see me? And I said, I don't know. I said, I have no idea. But I said, your face was there, just as clear as anything. And so I sent him a booklet on Osios Lucas. One thing led to another. And down the road, I had the privilege of baptizing him Lucas, after Blessed Luke. One of the, the units that we have uh, there was, was like an honor unit. And the goal of the place was to, to work men through this maximum secure prison and eventually get them back to a penitentiary. But to do that, they had to prove themselves faithful each step of the way. And so the very last step, I could go in and actually do services with, with the men. And I had like three of the Orthodox in there, and I was doing a service every Sunday evening. And one of the guys came who wasn't Orthodox, but he liked to come. And one day he's talking to me and, and he said, you know, on the outside I was a professional musician. And he said, Father, he said, uh, 
I just, I miss playing the guitar so much. And I said, well, I've got a guitar. I'll bring it to the service this next Sunday. And I said, you can, you can play us a tune before we start our service. And so I brought in the guitar. And each Sunday, I would bring my guitar down, and he, would, and he was good. He was so good. And one day he said to me, he said, Father, you know, he said, I could make this guitar sing if I just had a pick. And I said, well, that's nice, you know. And he said, no, no, he said, it's got to be a Martin 35 millimeter pick. He said, if I had a Martin 35 millimeter pick, he said, the things I could do with this guitar. I said, well, uh, I don't know what we can do about that. And I kept forgetting. Every week I was going to bring a pick in, and I forgot, I forgot, I forgot. One, one Sunday I was getting ready to go down there, and I thought, oh my gosh, I forgot his pick. So I, I took the little, you know, little plastic clip on a, on a, a bread thing, and I said, you know, I, I brought this. Would this work? He goes, oh. He goes, Father, I, I need a Martin, 35 mil. So I left, and I was gone for a couple weeks. And when I came back, I showed up Sunday night, and he said, Father, he goes, you're not going to believe this. Because this man, when he first came to me, he said, I, I don't know if I believe in God. I'm just here. I just, these other guys talked me into coming. He said, I don't know if I believe in God. He said, I decided to put God to the test. And so I prayed. And I said, God, if you're real, bring me a Martin 35 millimeter pick. <laughs> and I thought, ooh. I should have brought in one of those picks. And he said, these men worked in a, in a little factory kind of thing that we had where they could be tested, you know, to make sure they were going to be okay to go back to another prison. And as they passed out of their unit, they had to go through a metal detector, both going and coming into this place. And so they're, they're walking along, and each one has to go through the metal detector. And this is down in the very belly of this prison far removed from anything. And this man walks up, his turn at the metal detector, and he looks down, and lying on the ground is a pick. And he picks it up, and it's a Martin 35 millimeter pick. And he had it with him. And he said, Father, I can't keep this in my possession. He said, I want you to take it. But he said, I believe in God. How that pick got there, only God knows. God loves these guys. Incredible. Thank you, Jessica. The scriptures say, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. And the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the earth. For I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Um, right now, with Orthodox Christian prison ministries, we are facing some uphill battles. Uh, believe it or not, there are states, even my state of Colorado, which are not even recognizing the Holy Orthodox faith as being a legitimate religion. Can you believe that? We've had to go into to several states and, and fight this fight. But amazingly, what has happened, we, we did it in Massachusetts, we did it in Indiana, and in each of these states, in Colorado, uh, I met with the director of, of uh, the, the State Department of Corrections, and he's Orthodox. And I said, you know, they're not allowing us to come into the prisons because they say they don't, they don't think Orthodoxy is a legitimate religion. He said, I'll take care of it. He did. We're now a legitimate religion in the state of Colorado. <laughs> but in these other states, when we go and we talk to these people, what ends up happening is they go, why... We want you. Please come. Bring these programs in. This is tremendous. We want the Orthodox Church to be a part of us. But we've, we've got our work cut out, and, and uh, we'd ask you to pray for us uh, as, as we seek to, to make these things happen. 
uh, around the United States. Our goal in Orthodox Christian prison ministry is to establish Orthodox teams in every single state and to have those teams first to develop uh, volunteer coordinators or uh, team leaders in each state who will then coordinate and have people available, priests, lay people available to go into the prisons and, and to bring the Orthodox faith. We have Orthodox in prison right now. Uh, there's one state where, uh, I, I will share this because it's, it's the truth, but one state where there were four Orthodox in one prison. And uh, Chaplain Patrick, who's the director of OCPM, called a priest and said, you know, we have four Orthodox in a prison not far from you. Would, would you be willing to go in there? And he said, well, what kind of Orthodox are they? <laughs> he said, they're Russian Orthodox. He goes, well, let the Russians take care of the Russians. God, help us. Our goal is to, to make sure that these people are educated, the priests who would say things like that, or lay people who think that way, and to be able to go in and visit these men and to help them. Um, Orthodox Christian Prison Ministry offers tons of free stuff. Any inmate who writes us, any man or woman in prison who writes our office and says, I'm interested in the Orthodox faith, or I'm Orthodox, it doesn't matter. Could you send me something? We have books and icons that we can send out. And I brought some for you today. Uh, these icons done by, by men that were in prison. Uh, I brought four different ones for you uh, on the back table there. Please take, take one of each of them uh, for, for yourself. Uh, we also have a number of books. We have prayer books, different books. This particular book that I, I brought down with me uh, for you all is called Journey. And it's, it's just a wonderful set of writings of the early fathers. And it really helps these men see what the early church was about and, and what these great men and women of God had to say. So that is back there on the back table for you as well.